Would you please pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So during this uh, season of Lent, our scripture passages that we're going to be looking at during our worship time are from the Gospels that focus on the events leading up to Jesus in his final days in Jerusalem and to his death there. Lent, of course, is the 40-day season that leads up to Good Friday and Easter. And so the narrative we're going to be following for the next few Sundays will be following uh, that journey, will be led on to that final time in Jerusalem for Jesus and his ministry. In today's uh, scripture reading that Carl read for us from the Gospel of Luke, apparently some sympathetic Pharisees come and warn Jesus not to go to Jerusalem. Now by this time, King Herod has already killed Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, and now the Pharisees warn Jesus that Herod is gunning for him as well. But Jesus is committed to his course. He's demonstrating what Tricia just shared with the children, courage, courage. The adult Sunday school class that Tricia leads is working on that uh, book on courage. I've started a midweek uh, series on that same book, and it looks to be a pretty interesting study, the place that courage has in our Christian life. And this story that we have from the Gospel of Luke today, I think, demonstrates the kind of courage Jesus exemplified. We have some modern-day equivalents to that as well. I mean, the children talked about police officers, fire officers, all those who demonstrate courage in a very big way. But let me read the first part of this passage again, and, and let's see if somebody else comes to mind as well. Some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox for me, listen, I'm casting out demons performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way because it's impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Now, who might that sound like to you? Go and tell that fox. Well, I think the Ukrainian president is a portrait in courage. Vladimir Zelensky has said basically the same thing when Russia began its attack a couple of weeks ago. You tell that fox Putin that I am not leaving and I am not surrendering. While Jesus wouldn't be responding with armor and weapons, Zelensky in defending his country demonstrates that courage can be and often is costly, and very dangerous. So Jesus is headed towards the historic seat of Jewish power where both kings and priests have their home. Prophetic ministry in the face of power is a dangerous activity, jeopardizing the lives of those who would speak the truth of God's kingdom to the powers that be. And that's what Jesus is doing. This is no exception. But what really hits me is the absolutely crucial role that vulnerability plays in that kind of courage. To anticipate challenge and suffering and not look away is, by definition, to make oneself vulnerable for the sake of others. And that, I think, is important to notice because 
as a culture, we don't often equate vulnerability with courage and strength, with care and love and concern, certainly, but not often with courage and strength. At our worst, we see vulnerability as a sign of weakness, something to be avoided at all costs. But in this passage, I think Jesus demonstrates that vulnerability is essential to courage, stands at the core of the Christian life and invites us to discover that peculiar strength of being open, especially to the needs of those around us. But I'm also moved by the last part of that passage from Luke's gospel as well. Instead of calling down fire from heaven on the city that would kill the prophets and stone those sent to her, Jesus laments over the city. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. In this passage, Jesus chooses the image of a hen, not a mighty eagle, but a hen gathering her brood of chicks to her for protection and safety to illustrate the love and concern for God's people. Beyond affirming a very feminine image that really invites us to re-examine some of our views of God. It's also an image of unparalleled vulnerability. It is our strength out of vulnerability that spurs our courage and nourishes our, our strength simply because we will do and can do things for others that we simply can't or won't do necessarily for ourselves. And so Jesus continues on his way to Jerusalem. After being warned not to go, he continues not to prove himself fearless or to be a hero, not to make a sacrifice for sin to a judgmental God, not even to combat death and the devil. But Jesus marches to Jerusalem and embraces the cross out of a profound love for the people around him, like a mother's fierce love that will stop at nothing to protect her children. Brene Brown is a storyteller, teacher, researcher, former social worker, and through her TED Talks and books, and I would highly suggest you watch her TED Talk on YouTube entitled The Power of Vulnerability. She invites us to recognize that while vulnerability inevitably opens us up to feeling things we might want to avoid, it also spurs us to be more authentically human, more caring, compassionate, and courageous than we would otherwise be. Brown reminds us that courage, the word courage comes from the Latin phrase core or heart. And she defines courage as living from the heart, the willingness to embrace our vulnerability in order to be our authentic selves. She has found in her research that people who were feeling the most connected in life, who felt compassion for others and themselves, were the very ones who allowed themselves to be vulnerable. She reminds us that courage originally means to tell your story with your whole heart. And when you do that, what? That's the courage to be imperfect. So Christian courage, then, might be the kind of wholehearted living that comes from believing that as God's children, we are enough, 
and that those around us are also God's beloved children and therefore deserve our love, our empathy, and our respect. So what might vulnerable courage look like? It can take a myriad of forms, and with each person it'll look differently, but let me give you a small example maybe from my own life. On the issue of race relations, I know I don't have all the answers, but I'm willing to listen. I know I carry an unconscious bias. I'm willing to look at that and change. I know that as a privileged white male, I can't fully understand the experiences of those who struggle against racism but I want to support as strongly as possible the rights of others regardless. And I know that even as I say all of this, I am missing some important aspects of the work of dismantling racist structures and systems that not only keep people down, but in some cases even destroy them. But I want to be open to all that I need to do to make a difference. Now I'm going to divert a bit right now and I want to talk about your new pastor. I want to open up and share why I am excited about the way all of this is unfolding. As many of you know, I made the decision last fall to retire at the end of this appointment year. What is an appointment year, you ask? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> As ministers in the United Methodist system, we aren't hired by the local church. We're appointed by the bishop and her cabinet of district superintendents and other leaders to serve a particular church. And our appointments are always for a year at a time. They begin on July 1st, and go through to the end of June of the following year. And so I decided to retire at the end of this coming June. Our Staff Parish Relations Committee, or SPRC, is, is the link between the local church and the cabinet in this process. So once I made this decision, I notified our district superintendent, Dzin Lo Tong, and told him, and then I shared my decision with the Staff Parish Relations Committee. Now this retirement is not because I'm unhappy with this church. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. And the SPRC has been so very supportive of me and my ministry here from the beginning. They're not forcing me out just the opposite, and they have all shared that they wish that I could continue on, but they understand my decision. And so then I announced my decision in an email letter, the first part of December that went out to all of you. Now once that announcement had been made, the cabinet was then free to begin considering who the next pastor at the heart of Logmont should be. Our district superintendent visited with our SPRC early in February to discuss the needs and desires of the church in their new pastor. And so then the cabinet met following the time when Dzinlo met with our SPRC. And the decision then was made in the middle of February, who the next pastor for the heart of Longmont should be. Now, having been a former district superintendent and part of the cabinet for many years, making appointment decisions for a whole host of churches, I can tell you, and I, I bet Keith Watson would back me up on this, that the cabinet takes very seriously that responsibility. It's not something they take lightly. A lot of prayer, real prayer and discussion goes in to those decisions. And every church that is looking to have a pastoral change gets the same level of care. 
But, and this is where I get really excited, the fact that the cabinet made their decision fairly early in the appointment process tells me two things. One, they saw the needs of the heart of Longmont as a high priority. They didn't want to wait and get around to discussing us when the pool of potential candidates got smaller. They jumped right on it. And two, they saw the Reverend Claire McNulty Drews as the best, most qualified person for that position. They had faith in her ability to continue to lead this congregation and bring her own unique style and leadership and compassion to the heart of Longmont. Several years ago, I attended a clergy gathering where Claire preached to all of us. And that was my first introduction to her. Now, I don't always remember when I hear other pastors preach their sermons. But I remembered that one. Her sermon was outstanding. She talked about she and her husband and one of their sons planning to go on a hike. She's the mother of several boys. Her youngest is in high school. In fact, attends Skyline right up the street here. So she's not a, a young person straight out of seminary. She is younger than this old codger. <laughs> but she has had years of experience. Currently, she's serving two churches, Erie and Louisville, and I can't even begin to imagine what that must be like with the Marshall Fires and her church right there, the heart of that. Together, Erie and Louisville comprise what we call a three-quarter time appointment. The move to the heart of Longmont will mean that she will be able to come here and have a full-time appointment as your pastor. You won't be sharing her with any other churches. This is a full-time appointment. And she lives right close. How cool is that? Now, in case you don't already know this, I will be leaving with a heavy heart. Making this decision to retire was not easy. And you have been an outstanding parish to serve. So, as you can imagine, I want to leave you in the best hands possible. I think Bishop Karen and the Cabinet have made an outstanding choice. And I know that I'm going to be having more to say about this the closer we get to June 30th. I mean, face it, you weren't too sure about me the first time you saw me, right? <laughs> Who is this guy that looks like a cross between Santa Claus and Ed Asner, <laughs> but you gave me a chance. You demonstrated your courage in moving forward. You were vulnerable to open yourselves up to me and my ministry. And outside of a two-year-long worldwide pandemic, I think we've done pretty well. And so I ask you to give Claire the same chance. Neil? Thanks be to God. Let us pray. You call us to be people of faith, a people of courage, and we are so grateful that we have the example of Jesus being able to face what he knew was going to be a terrible time, face it head on with not only vulnerability and courage, but deep compassion. We ask, God, that you will lead us so that we too might share that courage, that type of courage and faith and compassion with others as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.